PM Modi recently inaugurated the Reva Ultra Mega Solar Power Project in Madhya Pradesh, which led to the greatest single site keyboard battle of the year. Why? Why you people like this? The plant has three units of 250 megawatts each. Three quarters of this power will be going to Madhya Pradesh's utility company and a quarter will power Delhi's metro system. The first instance of a solar project providing electricity to an interstate customer. And according to the Economic Times, it'll provide a quarter of its total daily requirement. It is spread over 1,600 acres. That's a lot of land where cattle won't graze again. Little critters won't scamper over. And what else can you do with vast tracts of land? Forests won't grow. But if you want to be with animals, go to the zoo. We're talking about progress here, buddy. Powering everything through solar energy. So let's get right down to it. The first question in front of us is how much total power do we need? In 2019, our installed capacity was 371 gigawatts. Taking the Rewa plant as a reference, we would need 500 such plants to cover it and 8 lakh acres of land. That's around 3,000 square kilometers, a little under the size of Goa. I'm okay with that. There are plenty of other nice beaches around. But remember, while coal and nuclear power plants run at 70 to 90% capacity when they're running, solar capacity factor is much lower due to clouds, the day-night cycle, and your latitude. Places near the equator get lots of direct sunlight, while on the poles, you have to mount solar panels vertically. The sun is so close to the horizon. So in Rewa, for example, you won't be generating 750 megawatts very often. That's just the nameplate capacity. You'll only be generating that much for a few hours on clear, cloudless days. Capacity factor of this plant will probably be around 20 to 30%. So even if we build out solar projects to cover our entire power production, it will only manage to meet a quarter to a third of our total energy requirement. So how do we get around this? Introducing the sunny side up curve. Wattzilla, a company based out of Finland, did an analysis of 145 countries to see what it would take for a country to go 100% renewable. The answer to how much solar potential India has is yes. We have all of it, as you may have noticed if you've ever walked under the midday sun in Chennai. According to Wattzilla, if we overbuild our solar capacity to four times our peak loads, we can meet the vast majority of our electricity needs through solar energy everywhere except in the extreme north, where the geography really favors hydroelectricity. Now, in some places, the percentage of solar potential is as high as 87%. And while we'll still need to build gas power plants for rainy days, the reduction in CO2 emissions will definitely be worth it. And we'll save money too. The final bid for Rewa power plant was under 3 rupees, around 2.9 rupees per unit. A unit is 1 kilowatt hour in case you didn't know. Actually, I didn't. Just for context, the typical consumption of an urban home is around 100 units. And 2.9 is not even the lowest price we have for solar. The Bhadla Solar Plant in Rajasthan received bids for 2.36 per unit. That is more than competitive with any existing form of energy generation we have today and will be cheaper for the end user even after distribution companies take their cut. With an installed capacity of 35 gigawatts, India is targeting 100 gigawatts by 2022. This will require immense political will. But a lot of factors are converging to make this happen. Firstly, a greater awareness of climate change. And more importantly, investment by international bodies in order to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. For example, the Rewa plant is funded by a $25 million loan given by the World Bank through their Clean Energy Fund at 0.25% interest. It's lower than the rate of inflation. Then you have the plummeting solar panel prices, along with the Western world's growing reluctance to depend on China as their sole manufacturing hub. Right now, 80% of the solar panels we use are from China. But due to the recent events, the government is pushing to make the climate more favorable for local manufacturing. This will be done in part by import tariffs on Chinese solar modules and funding Indian companies to help them expand their capabilities. The third big factor is utility-scale battery storage finally starting to become a reality. Tesla's Hornsdale battery system that backs up a wind power facility owned by Neon is a great proof of concept. It has delivered success after success for the company. And with Tesla's power packs, you can say without doubt that battery storage is poised to grow immensely in the coming decade. 
But if batteries are not your thing, then you might be happy to know that the European Union has committed to huge investments in green hydrogen, which is basically hydrogen made using renewable energy and water. There are a few other factors just off the top of my head that will grow solar power, but are a little more unpredictable. Grid-connected rooftop photovoltaics, for example, are becoming really popular. There are massive government subsidies, where a 5 kilowatt system costing 5 lakhs will cost you less than 2 lakhs to install and you'll be able to sell the excess electricity back to the grid, reducing your electricity bills drastically in the process. These usually have a warranty of 10 years at a minimum, so almost undoubtedly any new house that's being built in a sunny area should leave 500 square feet of space on the top. It just makes sense. And as Geo and Starlink spread the internet to remote areas, a lot of people may start moving to smaller communities, making independent grid-connected houses. This whole coronavirus thing may serve as a catalyst for that process. Subsidies are also being given to farmers wherein they can use grid-connected solar powers for irrigation and sell the excess to the utility company in order to earn as much as 30% of their monthly income. The government has been subsidizing solar panels for at least 20 years now. And it feels like the technology is finally coming of age. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I want those of you who watch till the end to consider the following proposition. What if we get to zero net carbon emissions? The temperature of the world stabilizes. We've saved Mother Earth. But we still can't go out in the afternoon. We still need to wait till 5 p.m. to go to the park and play. How about if we go the other way? Using our immense energy production, we use carbon scrubbers to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. 400 parts per million, 300, 200, until even the most extreme Chennai summer is no worse than, say, 28 degrees. Sure, North America might freeze over, but most of the world's population lives in the global south. An ideal temperature for human beings is 22 degrees. There's all sorts of research showing how our cognitive performance, our brains, everything works subpar at higher temperatures. Just an idea. Think about it. But don't tell people in the North. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe, and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.